Can you imagine wearing the same clothes every day without having the option to ever choose? No, that would be a nightmare. And unfortunately for me, I live in that nightmare every day. But that's my opinion, not the Army's. And, um, but the point is, people love new clothing. And for the buildings that houses its civilizations, that is the very same cloth for the civilization. And for people who design those buildings, the architects are fashion designers in the very same sense. Architecture in its modern conception is a relatively new invention. In the old days, people didn't design buildings. They just simply lived in them generation after generation. And when the need arise to construct a new building, they just copied the ones that came before them. And the only changes on them were forced through natural environments and just large themes throughout society. That's why you see a large division in the 21st century in the traditional uh, conceptions of what's a Western style building and an Eastern style oriental building. And architecture and urban planning in China is especially a new concept, kind of ironic given a country with more than four millennia of history. Because in the old days, only the emperors or the well-offs could afford to build, uh, to build buildings constructed by architects. And even then, architects were a very amateur profession in the prof uh, professional sense, because they were mostly bureaucrats and scholars with deep studies in uh, Confucian and Taoist traditions. So their constructions were really constrained and rigid in form. So what I want to show you today is how that train of thought and their perspective on form has changed throughout China's serpentine history of conquest, absorption, and domination by various dynasties and later on by two different ethnic minorities, first by the Yuan Dynasty uh, from the Mongolians and the Qing Dynasty from the Manchurians, and how they were brought into the Chinese fold and rather than the other way around. So the Chinese civilization started with the legendary Xia, Xia Dynasty. And I say legendary because its very existence is still being debated. And like all great civilizations, it started around a river, the Yellow River Basin. And the only idea of what their buildings looked like were drawings from subsequent dynasties. This building, this construction out of straw and wood was very light in weight and using a post and beam system allowed a very large interior space that was appropriate for both political purposes as well as religious worship. You can see its walls are made of a woven organic fabric later plastered with mud so the weight of the building did not have to be carried so much by the posts. And this resembles more of a straw hut than the forbidden city you see later built by the Ming Dynasty in the 16th century. The Xia Dynasty, rather primitive, was followed by the Qing Dynasty, which was really the first instance of a united China. And the famed terracotta warriors of Qin Shi Huang, who was the first emperor who united China, often over, um, we often overlook the fact that the Qing Dynasty was the first time the Chinese state started to play a very, the most important role in constructing infrastructures today, very much like the communist government still does in China today. This is an example of the traditional levies of the Du Jia Yuan, which was constructed by the Qing emperor. And this construction only lasted 15 years with construct, uh, conscripted labor. And you can see the sophistication and the level of water engineering, even to a construction that was 300 years before uh, BCE. So after making buildings out of wood for a long time, they realized several problems with building out of wood. Timber was a very scarce resource in northern China. It was prone to be burnt by the enemy, and it was prone to erosion because they did not have sprays that can prevent insects from getting on it. So they started to build out of mud. In particular, this is the very first section of the Great Wall built by the same emperor who united China using a construction method called rammed earth, where the earth will be put into the models left to dry, and then you'll form these walls. The problem with rammed earth is that it didn't look very good, nor could they build very high, and it too was prone to erosion. You'll see these walls were actually subsequently maintained by the minorities, the Chinese dynasty is placed along its border to maintain these walls, otherwise they wouldn't be there today. So people start building out of baked clay. Following the Qing dynasty, the two large dynasties that follow was the Han dynasty and the Tang dynasty. And what replaced the wide, uh, deeply enclosed compounds were multi-storied buildings like these. This, was, uh, this is the la uh, oldest surviving clay and wooden temple complex 
built in the Tang Dynasty, which was in fact sponsored by China's only and last legitimately ruling empress, Wu Zetian, who seized power by killing her own daughter and blaming it on another empress. Yeah. So this is the Yuan Dynasty. It's the first of the two ethnic minorities that took over China. It was by the Mongolians. And here, during this brief period, they only last about 100 years. They are the remnants of Genghis Khan's empire, the Chinese remnant, it divided into four. You can see this is the Jinnan Great Mosque. It was built as a fusion building out of necessity, not because they thought that a blend of three religious, uh, religions would look good. It was built in the center of the city where the three uh, ethnic groups lived. So I had to appease the Muslims, the Han Chinese, which made up 90% of the Chinese population, even back then, and the Mongolians, who were the ruling elites at this time. You can see in the right picture, the picture is clearly written in Chinese, in Chinese uh, traditional painting style, but the official is clad in Mongolian garb. And here I just want to mention briefly in the Chinese state and how it differs from our Western conceptions. Very much in the West, we often view the state as an outsider, as uh, someone that we have to win our freedom from. But in China, that concept is completely different. The Chinese view the state as the embodiment, the guardian, and the creator of many parts of its civilization, but especially as the guardian of its civilization. Whereas in the state, we view the state's power needs to be checked, delineated, and constantly revised. In China, they view the state as an intimate, but not just as intimate, an intimate member of the family, not just any regular member of the family, um, the head of the family, who, who's the patriarchy that sits at the head of the table. So you can see this role, the special role of the state uh, reflected both in its literature and certainly in its buildings. So this was finished, uh, the Forbidden City is finished in the Qing Dynasty, but it's really a continuation of what the Ming Emperor started. Here you can see this building is almost completely Ch Chinese styles. It reflects no ethnic origins of uh, the Manchurians who are nomads who lived on horsebacks until they conquered the rest of China. But if you look closer, every banner inscription describing what the building's name is, is written in always four or five languages. This reflected the Chinese emperor's status of the ruler of a multi-ethnic empire who routinely spoke more than five languages, very well-educated emperors. And the emphasis here is on the width and the form. Everything is constructed according to Taoist and feng shui traditions, but everything is also to make the building look wider. Unlike in the West, where buildings progressively got taller, in China, they never did run out of room to build. So the moat in front and everything in the flanks, there are actually two wings extending out of this front gate, it was to make the building wider. And the most amazing thing about the Forbidden City was that during its construction, not one single piece of nail was used. Everything is built by interlocking pieces of wood. Okay, so after the OPM War, at the end of the Qing Dynasty, you see again, the power of fusion in, uh, architecture, but this time in a much more prominent form. This is the ruin of the old uh, summer palace destroyed by the Japanese army during the A Army conquest of China. And this was the summer retreat of the emperor. And these were designed by the Jesuits, helped with uh, Chinese, Chinese traditional architects. And this in the front was particularly inspired by the Trevi Fountain, but with the Chinese zodiacs in the front. And uh, this is where the emperor would sit and enjoy his uh, Western imports like steak and bread. And records has it that the Chinese emperor ordered his steaks to be well cooked. And if you like well cooked steak and next time somebody says something to you, you can just say, I'm a connoisseur of fusion cuisine. <laughs> so after, uh, after the Qing Dynasty fell, 40 years after, the communists took power in 1946. 1946, they started to copy the Soviet style. A building in its, out, uh, in its outset reflected the equality of everybody, the, the colors, every, no matter how wealthy you are, you lived in one of these. But the problem with these is that they're very cheap, made out of concrete, and they didn't look very good at all. So the Chinese, and the Chinese were losing their sense of their ethnicity. So the Chinese government undertook the 10 great buildings project. There were 10 monuments designed across the country and I will show you a few examples. 
to, to show China's new communist influence, but as well as reflect its 4,000 years of heritage. On your left, you see the Beijing Railway Station, and on the left is their version of uh, Congress, the, the People's Hall, the Great Hall of the People. And here's another government building constructed in the set of 10. But these were essentially Soviet buildings just with the Chinese rooftop on top because that's the most uh, recognizable part of any Chinese building. So they started a period early 2000s, they started imitating everything Western. And this is actually the Congress of one of the provinces, the province of, uh, province of Henan. I think this is actually, it looks more magnificent than parliament or uh, Congress. And uh, since China is so great at imitating everything, why not imitate the best of both worlds? So this was when Chinese President Xi Jinping, three years ago, said enough, no more weird buildings. You can, literally in his decree, he said no more weird buildings. And the architects said, this is not very specific guidance, like how am I supposed to follow no more weird buildings? So they started a bureau to centralize all great constructions that must be, all major constructions in every province must be approved at a, almost a central level. So they tamed the architect's craziness a little bit. But this building is designed in the traditional Taoist virtue of fertility, built by the CEO of Hainan Airlines, one of the richest men in China, to house his new headquarters. And this building was in the midst of construction and then uh, President Xi Jinping declared his degree, uh, decree and was later modified to something else. This next building was the Chinese pavilion, uh, modeled after, during the World Expo in Shanghai, modeled after the crown of a Han Dynasty emperor. And you can see the clear resemblance there. And here's the capital of CCTV, which is the Chinese version of CNN, except it's state-owned. So they're pretty biased in their uh, <laughs> opinions. But it was modeled after a traditional pair of pants. And it's nicknamed the big underwear in Chinese. <laughs> I don't think that was the desired effect. But here is exactly what the Chinese uh, government is looking for. A sleek looking modern building that you would imagine you would find anywhere else in Dubai or Singapore, but modeled after the traditional landscape painting of Shan Shui. You can see the slick, uh, steel frame resembles water running down a waterfall. In my opinion, this is one of the most beautiful, beautiful buildings I've ever seen. And this is called the Chaoyang Plaza Park in Beijing. And this is one of the latest buildings that was hailed by the Chinese government as what buildings should look like. And another example of architects taking more inspirations from more mundane, uh, mundane inspirations is a building, the Sichuan uh, Museum, designed deliberately, apparently, to look like a box of falling chopsticks. But with that in mind, I hope as humanists, we welcome the deeply rooted differences of Chinese architecture, even uh, despite what that means, and despite what we can't see because uh, through our Western education and through our untrained eyes. And we welcome what the next stage in its evolution brings. Thank you.